my name is Silvio Ferretti and I, I live in Italy. I was born and raised in Genova, Italy, which is hometown for Christopher Columbus, supposedly. <laughs> There's been a, a long standing discussion about this, but yeah. We have Columbus's house there and millions of tourists visiting it. it I don't know whose house that was, but anyway. <laughs> It's supposedly his house. Well, the kind of music that I listened to mostly was pop music. Uh, I hated Italian pop music of the time, but every once in a while something better popped up. Like in the early 60s, I think it was 1963, we had the new Christian minstrels tour Italy and play and sing at the festival di Sanremo, which is a, has always been a pop music festival. I don't know what they were doing there, but they were there, and that was when I f saw my, the first banjo that I ever saw in my life. And about 50 years later, I happened to buy the banjo. <laughs> so, because I, I knew that that was the banjo that belonged to Larry Ramos of the New Christian Minstrels, and so I had to have it. The very banjo. Isn't it an incredible story? I grew up listening mostly to other kinds of acoustic music, like I was uh, very big into uh, Paul Simon, of course, James Taylor, you name them. Uh, actually, the first instrument that I learned to, to play was the piano. But you don't go very far with a piano in, in a bluegrass band, at least. <laughs> so I didn't even know what bluegrass was at the time. I first heard bluegrass from records that I stole from my uncle. He had a friend that was studying neurology in the States. And when he came, this guy came back to Italy, he brought gifts to his colleagues. And uh, he brought this uh, six... LPs, I guess it was, or maybe just four LP box set, Vanguard Records, and there was Earl Scruggs on them, Pete Seeger, Doc Watson. I mean, I fell in love with the sound. So uh, that was, I think I was 14 or 15 at the time. I was able to see Bluegrass live uh, in person, I mean. Uh, just in 1982, the first time I came to the U.S. Zero bluegrass. Well, no, I'm sorry, I'm lying. I I caught Bill Keith with Jim Rooney and the band that they had at the time, but not much, um, not long before 1982. I think it was 1980. I found an old copy of the Pete Seeger banjo book, and I started from that and of course my uncle's record and then I discovered the Manja newsletter the magazine and that helped a lot then I uh, got acquainted with Bill Keith when because he used to come to Italy fairly frequently and I made sure that that uh, I was there <laughs> to watch him play the story of red wine goes back is like 40 years actually we are celebrating our 40th anniversary but I started playing with Beppe Gambetta I'm sure you're familiar with him he was a very good guitar player at the time and I was not a, a very good guitar player at the time so uh, we stroke off a, a friendship and a, a musical duo in I think it was 1974 the story of red wine. Yeah, I started playing with Beppe Gambetta on New Year's Eve, 1974. He was he was a very good guitar player at the time, and I was a lousy guitar player at the time. But I had a banjo, a very cheap Italian model, which sounded like crap, obviously, but it was a banjo. So I I started playing the banjo because I could cope with Beppe guitar playing and after about two years I found another guitar player who was a very good guitar player as well he came from rock and pop music roots 
so he had the dexterity. And then we found a, a bass player, and Red Wine was born in 1978. The first gig we played was in June, I guess. It was a very hot night, and I still remember it with fond affection. <laughs> We did not play bluegrass entirely at the time. I mean, I was terrible in bluegrass, three-finger picking, mm, not so much, but I was pretty good in uh, at Seeger style. So we did material from the Weavers or other folk bands, uh, quite a bit of old-time music, American old-time music. And then when Martino came aboard, in 1981, we converted our, the band into full-time bluegrass. Martino, Martino was another crazy uh, acoustic music nut, uh, and I, I knew him uh, from playing with another band. And the other band lost the banjo player, so uh, for a, a while I was playing in two bands, Red Wine and the other one which made it convenient for us to book gigs because there was no uh, conflict of interest, of course. If we were available for one gig, then the other band could not play. As <laughs> simple as that. And then the, the two bands became one, actually. Uh, we got the, the bass player from the other band into Red Wine, and uh, that was the time when, when really started taking off musically. We became a bluegrass band around 81 or 82. We had seen enough bands at the time to have, get a knack of what bluegrass was. We found it terribly difficult to play. But of course we were, we were looking at bands like J.D. Crow in the New South. Martina was a big newgrass revival fan, so man, they're up there. <laughs> So that was our goal, but of course, we were kind of limited as far as learning how to play that stuff. Of course, we didn't go on for 40 years with the same people. Uh, unfortunately, we lost the bass player I was talking about, uh, who was an incredible singer and, and bass player, and he loved John Cowan, so for a while, he, he was pushing us to do that kind of material but he got sick with cancer so he passed away in 1993 uh, and we had to re we, we replaced him of course with another guy uh, Beppe left the band for good in 1991 to pursue his solo career so we had of course a new guitar player and then we had another guitar player and another bass player and for me uh, the real big moment was about 10 years ago when we had to replace our guitar player for different reasons um, and Martina suggested that Marco my son would step in and Mark at the time was a, a good banjo player, but it just played a little rhythm guitar, and that was it. So, well, Mark, of course, jumped at the occasion. Um, for the first couple of three gigs, we needed another guitar, a second guitar player to kind of have a more solid rhythm, but in a matter of two months, he was ready. So, effective of October, uh, 2008, he became the official <laughs> guitar player for Red Wine. Of course, having him in the band is a privilege for me. Uh, I get the privilege of spending a lot of time with him. Maybe he doesn't think the same, but <laughs> but I'm, I'm really really proud and happy. So and he's he's a veteran by now, 10 years with the band, and he started out good. I mean. 2008 we did a sh an IBMA showcase so he started from the top actually and then after about three or four years we found this incredible bass player Lucas Bellotti and that lifted the level another notch or two. Bluegrass has done a lot a lot to my life it had has helped me through really difficult times uh, 
uh, yeah, about 20 years ago, I was going through some, I mean, I was up the creek, <laughs> the proverbial creek, big time. And I had this great opportunity of touring the States for like three weeks. Um, I mean, it saved my life, literally. And now, having the opportunity of, of playing with this incredible band, we played most countries in Europe, the US, of course. Haven't played Japan yet, <laughs> but we might. Yeah, we just finished recording an album with Jens Kruger, uh, engineering it and producing it. Jens is an old friend, he's one of my heroes. It, for me, it was a humbling experience having him there, suggesting everybody what to do. I mean, transforming some songs from mm, pretty good to wow. <laughs> so we spent this incredible week in North Carolina with him. And uh, I believe it's going to be the best record ever for us, at least. It's, it already sounds great, unmixed. We have a website which is uh, redwinemusic.net and we have a Facebook page. Thank you so much for interviewing me.